walked it looking with a magnifying glass, you still would have walked right by it. Her husband tried to call her cell phone, but got no answer. Yet because of the way cellular networks function, even this offered hope. Cell phone systems blanket their coverage areas with towers that send and receive signals. Each base station covers an area of about 10 square miles. As well as transmitting voice and data, a cell phone constantly sends out a locator beacon. As the phone moves between areas, the tower carrying the weakening signal hands it off to another tower with a stronger beacon. And that can be a lifesaver. You've been in an accident, you're, you're injured, you can't make a phone call, but your phone is still on, and people are waiting for you, they start to call, or they identify that your phone is, is, is still live, we can locate you that way. As long as your phone is on and working, we'll be able to find you. That's because in order to route calls to you, your cell phone company is receiving a signal from your phone, whether you're talking on it or not. And cell companies keep records of each tower that your cell phone contacts. So imagine you have, you're in a car accident and it's been a couple of days and your cell phone battery is dead and you're looking for someone to find you. We could look at the last call that you made on your cell phone and the tower that was associated with that call and that would be the starting point. So even if you haven't made a call, you're not calling out and your phone is dead, we can still use cell phone technology to try and locate you. When Tanya Ryder was officially declared missing, Police checked phone company records and discovered the most recent link, or ping, between her phone and the closest cell tower days earlier. And that zeroes in the location of that cell phone to within a five mile radius of the closest cell tower. So that narrowed our search parameters down to within five miles. But this and the little cell phone beep saved her life. The fact that they spotted something crumpled in the brush it is very impressive. And they wouldn't even have found that if it hadn't been for this cell phone ping. Within hours, Tanya Ryder was found alive in her vehicle and rushed to hospital. Some cell phones have satellite-based GPS chips built in, which tell the phone company exactly where your phone is. Even without a GPS signal, your phone's location can be determined by triangulating its signal from three adjacent towers. Wherever you go with your cell phone turned on, you leave a digital footprint. Cell phone companies do keep records of where the calls were made and which towers were used to make those calls because that impacts how we bill the customers for the services that we provide to them. Now that is confidential information. Your cell phone calls and where you make them is absolutely private. Concern over privacy poses a challenge for phone companies and law enforcement agencies. Tom Ryder thinks it took too long for police to get Tanya's cell phone records. The policy that tied their hands nearly cost my wife her life. In this case, it took a couple of days to be able to properly make the assessment that this was an accident rather than her leaving voluntarily. So, should police have asked the cell phone company for Tanya's confidential phone records earlier? It, it really isn't that easy, and I think we have to remember that there's a lot of personal information that is private. It's not up to us to decide, so we need a third party, like a police organization, the RCMP, or another legitimate body, to give us a legitimate reason to provide that information. While technology is changing at lightning pace, solving some of the sticky problems it presents will take time. The only thing I want to come out of this is maybe somebody else will not sit in their car for eight days alone. Of all the information your cell phone will ever transmit, a silent beacon may be the most important. Our phones have become extensions of ourselves. We're trained right from the start to rely on them in a crisis. You know, my experience growing up as a kid was when you picked up that phone, there was always a dial tone. And you could always dial 911 or call the police or call your dad at the office or whatever, even in a blackout. Tyson McCauley is author of the book Critical Infrastructure. What we're faced with now is, uh, is a situation where 
We've put many more assets onto this, um, this one network. And the assumptions we have about its resilience and its ability to uh, be there when we need it um, have to match reality. Take emergency services. Depending on the kind of phone connection you have, dialing 911 may not get the response you expect. Calgary, Alberta. Three years ago, the Luck family moved here from the Toronto area. Instead of a standard landline telephone, they opted for a VoIP or voice over internet protocol connection. It converts your voice to a digital signal and transmits it over the internet. It's less expensive than a landline and software can even make long distance calls free, just like email. In most respects, this new technology works just like a conventional phone system. But there is one important difference the Luck family didn't know about, and that proved disastrous. Elijah Luck was born prematurely, with fluid in his lungs and a weak heart. In May 2008, when he was 18 months old, Elijah suffered a seizure and went into medical distress. While his mother tried desperately to help him, Elijah's aunt Sylvia phoned for help. I dialed 911 and it rang five times. Nobody answers, which was very, you know, unusual of 911. But when I just put the receiver down, I get a call from 911 asking me if I had called them. And I said, yes, and I'm in desperate need. My, our baby is passing away and we need an ambulance. And the lady on the phone said, you know, help is on the way. It wasn't. Precious minutes slipped by. My wife, in desperation, called 911 again. And the same lady picked up the phone and uh, she said, yes, help is on the way. The Lux 911 voice over IP calls had actually connected to an operator with Comwave, the family's internet service provider 2,700 kilometers away in Concord, Ontario. That call center inadvertently dispatched an ambulance to the Lux old address in Mississauga. In Calgary, when no emergency services arrived and with Elijah's condition growing worse, the next door neighbor called 911 on her landline. Within six minutes, an ambulance arrived, but it was too late. He was fighting when they were doing the CPR and when the, uh, the EMS had taken him to the hospital, um, he was not, not moving, but then at the hospital they declared him dead. They thought they were talking to public safety communications here in Calgary. In fact, they were talking to the contact center operated by their VoIP provider. Unlike a dedicated phone line, some voice over IP networks don't connect directly to local emergency services. 911 for what city? The heartbreaking loss of baby Elijah might have been prevented if the internet phone network was better integrated with the 911 emergency system. We were not aware of this 911 issue, and so uh, we want people to know that they should be aware of it. We don't want this to happen to other families, too. Until we dialed 911, we didn't know what technology was and how it can fail us. I want people out there to know. Check, check what facilities you get before you're going for all these fancy fancy technologies. The internet has not been designed as, as a lifeline network. It was uh, an academic research network, and largely now it's, it's often a recreational network, uh, which has been turned to commercial purposes. But it is not a high assurance commercial network intended to support lifeline critical services. As new technology comes out and goes to market, those connections back to 911 and public safety aren't made. 911 is still a phone number. It's not an email address, it's not a text address, it's not an SMS address. We take that lifeline for granted. Assuming the infrastructure it's built 